talking about the PC, internet, cloud computing, and his career in them, as well as the next big shift in cloud computing. He's an expert in um, this and digital infrastructures and trains cloud providers. So give a round of applause for Peter Van Eyck. So welcome everybody. Um, why the applause? I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> So you, you might ask why an, an, an old guy like me, uh, well, experienced guy like me, talk to you. Uh, who of you has seen Vint Cerf uh, talk? Yeah, everybody. So well, he's, he's he's a little bit more experienced than I am, but I I, I guess from from your perspective, we're from the same age. So. Anyway, the, today's presentation is you know uh, about the development of technology in a certain um, perspective. Uh, my personal you know, role in it, and um, I hope you enjoy some of the lessons of that. So, uh, because, you know, as I say, those, those, who, those who ignore history are forced to repeat it, and I would say those who study history have a choice to repeat it. So, take your pick. Uh, sorry, what I'm going to do to you is uh, you know, describe four decades of IT, three major innovations that happened in those times, two important drivers for that, and then one final word of warning. How many of you guys ever wrote a piece of software? Or, you know, typed a formula in Excel, or what have you? Uh, who has more than 10 years of uh, experience in doing that? 20 years? 30 years? I don't see many hands anymore. Anyway, 40 years ago, I wrote my first computer program. Uh, give it one or two weeks. It was actually in the early fall. And it was on a machine like this. Actually, it was on a machine like this. Actually, it was a Burrow 6700, but this, this is a prettier picture. But it was the same class of machine. And they were uh, pretty interesting machines. So, you know, what happened after that? Well, then we had Moore's law. It says, well, uh, you know, processing capacity, number of transistors, any any measure of speed that you have in IT is about doubling uh, every you know 18 months or so. Moore formulated this in the early 60s, but I read the other day that this guy was going back into you know computing technology like a hundred years, and it has been going on all that time. So what does that uh, what what does that mean? Um, you know, in, uh, in 1976, which was a couple of years after I wrote my first computer program, you could put an entire processor on a single chip, right? Uh, by 1977, uh, those chips were being used in, you know, fully assembled PCs that you can buy. And, and that was what Steve Jobs did with the Apple II, for example. Around 1990, these PCs became so powerful that they could work as servers in a, in a department or what have you. And your average data center these, day, these days is not filled with mainframes, it's filled with PC-style technology. It's you know, PCs on steroids in a way. So the PC, in the end, made the mainframe irrelevant. And that's just an awesome increase of capacity that has you know, uh, made lots of waves in the industry. And so that's the, the first big innovation, or disruptive innovation that I witnessed. What did it have to do with my career? Well, actually, I wasn't having a career at that time because I was still at school. But in, in 76, I realized, wow, I mean, we're working with terminals and this big stuff, you know? We could put all that stuff in, in, in a single, in a box, you know? The, the computer could be smaller than the terminal that we used to, to program it. That was amazing. But as I said, I was at school. Um, I didn't have any money. Uh, I mean, Wages were lower than in the U.S. and the equipment cost was higher, so no chance I could become Steve Jobs at that time. I went to the university uh, instead. Um, Steve Jobs didn't, so you take your pick. What's the best choice? And I ignored PCs for a long time uh, because at the university, I really, I, I really, I had all the co processing capacity that I need. I mean, a PC was like a bicycle or uh, you know, a kid's bicycle, really. Whereas at the university, I could drive a Ferrari. Compile a 2,000 line program in two seconds flat in 1979. My PC still doesn't do that. So that was good stuff. Uh, and I couldn't ignore it for a while. So the other innovation. Okay. This is an um, early 50-ish telephone. 
that was the uh, best telecommunications that we had in that time. The world depended on it. Again, Moore's law uh, turned that technology into fiber and each of those strands had more capacity than the entire telephone office that, that was in the previous slide. And what does that mean? Well, it means a tremendous you know, change in, in the way we can communicate. For example, in 1970, so uh, slightly before I wrote my first computer program, or around that time, to make a phone call of one minute from Europe to the US would cost you about the same amount of money as an average you know, laborer would earn in an hour, right? That amount of money. Then, in uh, like 15 years later, an hour's worth of work would buy you about an hour of you know, phoning up across the Atlantic. And these days, if you work for an hour in a you know, developed country, in a, in, a, in, like in a Western world, that amount of money, think about it, how much money would that be? That amount of money buys you a, a, like an ADSL or a cable internet connection 24 hours, 31 days a month. And on that connection, you can run like four video streams at the same time, right? So there's a tremendous change in, in, in technology. And that, you know, the, the telephone world is not the same anymore. You know, there's no money in telephony anymore. So a lot of, you know, changing companies, a lot of disruption going on. And all that then led us to the internet. Now, how big is the internet? We don't really know, but to give you a feel, you should assume that like every pixel on that uh, picture, every single picture is about an entire network, right? So, and, and the bigger groups in the middle are these huge uh, internet providers that have cables all over the world. This is our connected world. So, what happened to my career? Well, I, as I finished university, I went to um, another university and started research, research in computer networking. That was new at the, st at the time. That was like, well, it wasn't really the telephone era, but it wasn't the video era either. Actually, we didn't even have internet at the university when I, I, I did my PhD. Uh, after that, I went to work at an IT provider, who shall remain uh, nameless at this point in time. Um, then I thought, well, you know, there, there's hotter stuff. Then the first people started to make, you know, be professionally employed in an internet provider. That was around in, in the Netherlands, around 70, no, sorry, 93, 94. We had the first, you know, person who actually could make money off of providing internet services. Before that, it was a university uh, thing. Now we have thousands of people in that industry. I moved to a, um, a, a European internet provider but it didn't work out very well, so I got fired. Anyway, I was, I was, I mean, I was caught in the crossfire between opposing groups there. At least that's the story that I make of it right now. So, where does that bring us? Um, the, the, now back to, 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 uh, to computing technology again. This is what a data center looks like uh, when, when you're building it. Now, if you're, building a company, well, like 20 years ago, if you build a company and you had to have this computer capacity, you had to build something like that as well. Now, how long does it take? How much money does it take? It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nuisance. And uh, one the guy who wrote Net, uh, Mozilla, no, sorry, the uh, Netscape, uh, he's a VC right now, he said in, nine, in, in 2001, to have a, you know, even in 2001, if you had a company, that need, needed computers to do basic stuff, you would have a run cost of $150,000 a month. So that's a big, you know, step to take. And you would have to have the stuff uh, on your own. Cloud computing is, is more like the, the utility model, you know, where every time I build a new plant, I don't want to build a new electricity uh, uh, factory next to it. You just buy it off of the grid. That's the, the metaphor that comes with it. Now, I could go on and on and on about cloud computing, uh, but that I, that I do uh, uh, next week again. So uh, what, was it, what was driving this? Well, around 1999, uh, so th these PC-based PC servers got too powerful in a way. I mean, they were growing and growing and growing, 
and they were outgrowing the jobs that were running on them, in a way. So, um, uh, the next thing to do is, you know, you go share these, these PCs in one way or another, so that you could put multiple uses to it. And uh, the technology for that is virtualization, that's about, you know, I think it was older than, than, than my programming experience, but th that's, that's the time when it really got off the ground with VMware and stuff. So sharing all those servers to multiple tenants. At the same time, I showed you the internet, growing and growing, connecting every nook and cranny, and uh, you know, saturating every household and at least every business. So, I mean, that's, that got together and that it made more sense to emerge, to have this, 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 this we, we didn't, I should tell this in a different way. When we bought the next computer, it would not be like, where we do we put it, put it in Office A or Office B. No, we'll put it somewhere where, you know, in that cloud of data that connects everything. And that's how the word cloud computing started. It was actually computing in the cloud. And before that, we said um, application service provisioning, again, with this utility model. And that became possible, you know, around 2000, 2001. Um, well, that's been obviously very big right now. But what's the you know, mind shift behind that, the big, the big shift there? Way back, you know, this is a, what a corporate IT manager uh, uh, image was with respect to his data center, right? especially when it comes to security in his data center. It's a big, big fortress with a big wall around it, big firewall and a really, really very tiny link to the outside world, right? That's the traditional data center model. But does it make sense these days? Well, I say, where's your data? Is it in that data center? No, where's your data? It's all over the world. It's, it's, it's coming from all nooks and crannies and places. When I talk to my customers, when I have interaction, business interaction with my customers, that's where the interesting data comes from. The interesting data comes from outside of my company. It does not exist in my company. Well, some of it exists in my company, but the most interesting data for the company these days, digital data, is stored or, it, or at least originate outside of that company. So if you can say, if you can say well, and one, one place where it's happening is, is like this. You know? Each and every one of those devices has more memory than the mainframe computer that I showed you in the first slide. Each and every one of them. Even the old Nokia 6220, whatever it was. The, the one you could drop from the third floor and it would still work. You know, that one. They don't make them anymore. Why is that? There's no replacement market for it. They're all still alive. So, um, this is a really, really big shift. And, and, uh, and the impact of that shift is much more profound than we can imagine right now. For example, think of, let's say, the center of gravity of all the bits in the world. So where are all the interesting bits in the world, all the digital bits in the world? In, in 1970, all digitally stored information was in a data center. In the mainframe, the mainframe in the data center. And computers were so rare in my country that whenever th there was a new one bought, it came in by plane and there was a photo shoot of it. Digital data is, is, originates here. This is where the bulk of digital data is these days. So the center of gravity of data is moving from inside the data center to outside the data center. Now, what does that mean for, for managing that data, for securing that data from the perspective of the business? It's a total change of mind. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Good. So what did I do? Well. You know, this, this sharing of, of servers that I talked to you about, uh, that was my consulting business. We did shared service centers, you know, getting the, the, the servers out of the closets and into a corporate data center. And then this stuff came along. But said, so, well, this is not going to be a business for me anymore. This, this cloud computing stuff is so damn cheap. It doesn't make any sense to continue, you know, uh, consolidating those servers. It is better scrap them and get this cloud computing stuff going. So I said, well, I looked at it and said, oh no, this is, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to change my career. I uh, didn't really pick up uh, painting, but it was uh, a change of mind anyway. And then somebody said, well, we're, we're getting these questions from big corporations that have to work with cloud computing. 
uh, we actually sold to them uh, that they need to train all their people on it. So can you write a course for us? I said, well, yeah, um, why would you, what's the problem then that they're having? Oh, they explained it to me and then you know, it, it appeared to me that the issues around cloud computing are much more complicated than they appear at first sight. Obviously for the consumer, it sounds very easy and, and it is for a regular consumer, but for a bigger company to consume cloud services is actually very difficult. And to be a provider of cloud services is actually much harder than being just a good IT shop in a big company. So here's a uh, new level of maturities, um, so to say, and you know that's the kind of training that, that I've been developing. So I help people do cloud, cloud security, I help cloud providers become better cloud providers. Um, and now finally I've you know, um, made good on one of those big innovations. The first one I, I ignored, the second one I got fired out of, and now, and now I'm really having a, a good job. So back to those, uh, just to, to you know, get back to those three big changes. Mainframe to PC, telephony, internet, data center, cloud computing. And each of those, you see big, big, big shifts and disrupting shifts. You know? Stuff that you know, turns around the industry. IBM reinvented itself, right? Uh, it's now a services company. They were lucky. I mean, it was a, a narrow escape. The, 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 the manufacturer of the original computer that I learned program on, Burroughs, no longer exists. Univac does not exist. Digital equipment does not exist anymore. They're all folded, right? And we have new, you know, new people come up. And now we actually have phone companies get bought by software companies. So, and this stuff, the, the PTTs, as they were called, if you're from, you know, other than the US and the rest of the world call them post telephony and telegraph. You know, they don't exist anymore. We don't do telephony as, as, a, as a primary service anymore. I mean, we buy internet service and then we run VoIP over it, or Skype or Facebook or whatever. So, another one bites the dust. Then the data centers. Well, need I say more? So, what are the underlying principles in this change? Because there is a structural and, and, and in, a, in a way gradual change that uh, has funny, you know, moments in it. And I'll explain the two big principles for you. The first one, it's called the tipping point. Anybody heard of the, 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 the concept of Malcolm Gladwell, the tipping point? Yeah, okay. So the, the idea of a tipping point is that you gradually, something moves gradually, like that dog, and at a certain point in time, it tips over. To give you an example of that, back in, in when I was programming at the university doing my uh, masters, um, you know, we had some privileges. We could actually make phone calls. Uh, at the university's expense. So, whenever I had to make a phone call, uh, no, a uh, non-local phone call, I took my bike, I, I rode to the university, and then I made the phone call, because it was too damn expensive to do that back home. Right? Uh, and even as I was working at the university and doing my PhD, we were still doing that. You know, phone calls for, for business, and now we do that at the office. You know? And then somewhere at the late 90s, I find myself making phone calls at home so that I did not have to go to the office, right? Not in a traffic jam and not spend a lot of money or in a train or whatever. Um, do teleconferences so that we don't have to fly. So that gradual, gradual change in the value or the cost of, a, of communications at some point in time made it tip over how I organized my business. And this is just a simple example. And if you look around, you see these examples all over the place. Something starts out you know, uh, in a certain way and it sort of moves gradually, 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 and at some point in time, poof, it changes. Now the way, why, uh, how that changes in a disruptive way, that's the, the principle of disruptive innovation. That's actually management strategic theory around this. Now what's the, what's the disruptive innovation? Um, it is uh, one that is, you know, it, it, it's, it's completely different from the thing it's replacing in, in, uh, in, in structure. It's much cheaper. It's not as good uh, as the incumbent. Actually, it's pretty bad, generally. Uh, but it's rapidly improving. 
um, more rapid than the stuff that it, it in the end replaces. And, and in the end, it drives the original out of the market. And why is that? Well, because it, it sort of it addresses overserved customers, customers that don't want to pay the full price or are not capable of paying the full price, but um, and they don't need the full bell, all the bells and whistles. You know, they and the examples are you know mass manufacturing in general uh, is a uh, you know mass manufactured you know piece of uh, you know cutlery for that matter. Is it better than what you can what a craftsman can can make with? Finally, you know, um, custom tailored, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. No, it's not, but it's a lot cheaper. And in the end, that mass manufacturing actually actually gets better because you do it so often. The PC, you know, P the early PCs were like um, had an address space of 640 kilobytes, right? That doesn't even boot my phone these days, right? Uh, and uh, and it was. Uh, way less than what the mainframe had, and it was slow, 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 and no other space. It was awful in that sense. But it got better really rapidly because of Moore's law. Internet, same thing. No, I, I, I had a project where we uh, we ran leased lines between offices, leased lines for a hundred kilometers. Monthly cost like a thousand euros, a thousand euros for a leased line. And then we said, well, we'll replace them with the internet. No, nah, no, nah, it's not reliable, which it wasn't at the time. But right now, it is, because the internet keeps getting better and keeps getting faster. Wikipedia, a non-technical thing, although there's a technical you know, uh, support structure underneath. Originally, Wikipedia was like, uh, okay, there's some stuff you can find, but the Encyclopedia Britannica is authoritative and much better. How much is Encyclopedia Britannica selling these days? It isn't, because it's dead. Wikipedia is now much better than the Encyc Encyclopedia Britannica. Just a small tip, if you want to find a translation of a certain concept, not the wor word, but a concept, go figure it out in your own language in wi on Wikipedia. And oftentimes, you can see you know, by language the translated lemmas. So then you know that you get the concept translated right. Uh, and of course, cloud computing. As Mark Andreessen was saying, uh, the, the, the Netscape guy, 150,000 bucks a month to run a basic internet company in 2001. How much does it take you to run a basic internet company this month? No. 50, 100 dollars. It's so much easier to start up a new company. And all the hosting companies have a hard time doing that. So, what's the next one? It's our four decades of the IT experience. Uh, three major innovations. Um, I was saying the third innovation not because it's the third best, but it's the third in sequence. You get to decide which one is the biggest innovation. But more interesting, uh, I think a lot of you people would be interested in what is the fourth biggest innovation. I don't know, because uh, I can't for foresee the future, but I can give you some ideas. You know? Moore's law will keep on generating new tipping points and new disruptive innov and, and, and thus create the opportunity for new disruptive innovations. Uh, I don't know what's next. I mean, I hear a lot about the Internet of Things these days. Sensor networks with a dollar a piece or less, you know. Look at that. Uh, you can revolutionize gardening in that way or growing crops or whatever. How many computers are there in this picture? A, a computer as in a programmable device but with at least a couple of, you know, let's say, uh, like 100K of memory per device. There's hundreds of them, and this is just the beginning. It'll be, it'll be much, you know, it, it will go for much further than that. So with all this awesome power, also comes some responsibility, right? A bit of history. Ever seen this guy, Dwight D. Eisenhower? He's a five-star general. In peacetime, you don't have five-star generals. They reserve that for wartime. So he's the top of the line back then. And what are his accomplishments? Well, some say he ended World War II. I think it's a bit over-exaggerated, but he did have a serious contribution to it. Uh, after World War II, he became the first su supreme commander of NATO, um, a reckonable force in the, in, in the, in the world's history uh, up until the 80s. Uh, maybe, maybe now uh, as well, uh, but at least in, in the Cold War area. 
And then he was so popular, he became the uh, president of the United States for eight consecutive years. He got re-elected. And in that time, he instituted NASA and DARPA. And I'll get back to this. Because, um, you know, he had an idea on, on innovating in the U.S. One thing he did, for example, before NASA and DARPA was in institute the federal highway system. As a, before the war, as a, as a military, they, they ran a convoy from east to west, and the average speed was 10 kilometers an hour. Or was it 10 kilometers a day? It was pretty damn slow, because there was all these back roads. So he understood infrastructure. So that's why he instituted NASA and DARPA as technology, technology infrastructure vehicles. So, what would General Eisenhower say about PRISM? Right? So here's a guy who's uh, U.S. president for eight consecutive years. He's one of the few U.S. presidents who have a strong military background. So he is the representation of the military and the state government's power of the, uh, at least back then, the most powerful nation in the world. So what would he say about PRISM? Would it be good or bad? Well, what he, he didn't say anything about PRISM because he's long dead. But this is a, a quote from his farewell speech in 1961. At, uh, mid, we're at the height of the Cold War, right, right then. The Cold War, wh where America was afraid of being overrun by the Russians. How little did we know then? I was two years old by that time. And he said, we must guard against acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. He introduced the word military-industrial complex. And it's a warning. It's like, Listen, we don't, we don't want to, you know, um, we don't want to be driven by the military or the, the, the industry that it supports. We need them for our safety. Without th these guys, the military industrial complex, we will lose the Cold War. But left to their own devices, they will accumulate more and more and more power as a mechanism, not by choice, but as a mechanism. We must guard against that. So. Eisenhower created DARPA, right? Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. DARPA created the Internet, right? The Internet is the basis, the facilitation of uh, facilitated cloud computing, right? So in a way, so the question is, whose Internet is it really? And maybe PRISM is like a wake-up call, you know, where the military says, well, uh, you've played around long enough with the Internet now, we want it back. But, you know, everybody of you who is in technology has to deal with the fact that a lot of this technology is state-sponsored, especially the innovations. Vint Cerf said it, said it himself, right? So, whose side are you on? No? Which side are you on? Are you, are you with the, the contractors that help NSA to acquire more intelligence? Are you providing technology to them, knowingly or unknowingly? Yeah. Are you a hacker for a hacktivist? How, respons the, how responsible are you working with the technology? For whom do you do it? Um, maybe it's a pretty hard choice, you know? Maybe these two are somehow related. Spoiler, spoiler. <laughs> so, the future is yours. Innovate, because you know, without innovation we're all dead. Yeah. Study history. If you don't study history, you're forced to repeat it. If you study history, you can make a choice what to repeat of it. And I gave you the two drivers. Learn how to figure out you know, these tip tipping points. And learn how to figure out how these disruptive innovations work. I gave you three examples. There are tons of them. Go look on Wikipedia. There are some really nice examples there. And, you know, uh, the choice is yours. I expect all of you... Yeah, to make up your own minds, uh, make up your own moral framework, and, and do what you need to do. So, if you need any help, I can still do that. Uh, either better cloud security or more successful provider, yeah, talk to me. Um, with that, I, I, I thank you. Any questions? Any questions? Raise your hand, guys. Okay, here's a question. I hope you can hear me very well because I'm getting a lot of crosstalk here, so. 
Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, um, in your role, sort of uh, working with companies and getting them used to sort of yeah, I'm cloud computing. Yeah, um, ah, here's do, much bigger. Do you find that there's, um, do you find it difficult to communicate to people that, you know, if EC2 West Coast goes down, that means even though their stuff's all in the, cl their cl the cloud, that uh, still means it's all going to disappear. Like, do, do people really recognize that however much it's in the cloud, it's still on hardware, and there are still some <laughs> things you can't do there? Well, as a matter of fact, um, there's, there's, two types of, there's two types of people, you know? Um, one of the reasons why I got into cloud security, because was, uh, there's a lot of people saying, well, we, we, we want to go in the cloud, but we're not sure it's, it's secure, you know? We're, turns out they're afraid of the water anyway, but uh, there's, a, there's quite a few who, who, if they don't understand secu the security implications or where their data is, they get so scared, they still try to run it in their own data centers or in their own closets, as the case may be. And then there's the other group that uh, is like, okay, well, you just throw it in the cloud uh, then, because we can't afford to do it ourselves. Um, and they have to be educated a little bit further on availability zones and uh, you know resilience and stuff. Um, and some of them, basically, uh, you know, with the first major EC2 out outage, I think one and a half year ago, um, some of those companies went down for for a couple of hours, and they said, "Well, yeah, you know, uh, we went down together with EC2 for for a while. We didn't really lose any data, but you know, we didn't deliver any service for a day or so." Um, and that sucks, but uh, had it not been, if, if EC2 was not there, wouldn't have been there, we wouldn't have been a company at all. You know, it's <laughs> EC2 facilitate, facilitated us in doing this, and our fate is shared with EC2 in a way. And most of those companies still exist. So you can, you can uh, state it as, an, as a calculated risk. Generally speaking, people are uh, more risk averse than, um, uh, than they need to be. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Any more questions, guys? Hands up. We got 15 more minutes, uh, but if you want to crash out, uh, uh, no offense. Um, I don't know if you've heard about it. I'm sorry, I need to send what's the speaker here. Yeah. So, uh, relating to uh, the technology that's around currently, um, and which is presently is coming out in the next few months, uh, something like a parallel board or something, I can't remember the exact name, but it's about five. Uh, to 50 gigahertz uh, processing. Yeah. Uh, how will that relate to it if we haven't got the infrastructures uh, in place to get to the cloud? Surely the cloud won't be that useful apart from just storing your Word documents until you get home. You know? um, let me see. I, the way I understand the question is, uh, we'll be getting a lot faster hardware. A lot faster hardware, uh, but will the cloud be able to uh, utilize that? Uh, will help it? It like, you know, when they're able to work together better. You're talking about 50 gigahertz processors? Well, yeah, and at home. And at home, like $69, you know. Okay, you mean you get, you get all the cheap yeah, hardware so you need at home? Into, it's yeah. going to go into embedded devices and etc. And then, you know. Well, the, uh, I, I didn't go into the um, five essential characteristics of cloud computing, um, which, because, which that's a course in itself. Uh, but cheaper processing power in itself uh, is one of the worst reasons for, for utilizing cloud computing. Um, if you're running a reasonable workload um, that's fairly stable, then cloud computing is generally more expensive. The business benefit of cloud computing is not in cheaper cycles, generally speaking. That, that was why I was saying the cost is actually really going to come down. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, uh, uh, CPU cycles is only one portion of your total cost yeah, of ownership yeah, yeah. of an IT system. Yeah. What we see in companies, uh, what are the, uh, there are a few typical usage scenarios for cloud computing in a corporate environment. And the biggest one really is uh, enabling uh, your remote workers and your business partners to, to work better with you rather than uh, you know, uh, reducing your Microsoft Exchange license cost, even though that's a fringe benefit. But that will only cover the, 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 the project cost, not the, won't give you a lot of business benefits in itself. So, and there's more to cloud than just you know, cheaper processing. Yeah. I just wondered about the impact. Yeah. And it also, I mean, history, uh, history has proven um, 
Now, it was like in 1947, that was a study by IBM where they said, well, we can't imagine that there is a world market for more than five or 10 computers, because we don't can't figure out what people want to do with it. Bill Gates saying, why in the world would anybody need more than 650 kilobytes of, kilobytes of memory on his PC? Well, you know where, where that led to. So our, our, our appetite for processing is, is uh, you know, keeping track of uh, technological developments. Okay, thank you for the question. More? Any more questions, guys? There's a question over there, yep. Let me stand over here, I can hear your question better. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter, for a good presentation. Um, You're welcome. Just on that last point of the word of warning you had, um, just, I'm just kind of getting my head around, like, I'm not a big techie, I have to say, but where does all this stuff get stored in the cloud, <laughs> and who has access to it? Because I know, for example, in the U.S., they have something called the Patriot Act. Yes. Which I'm sure you are aware of. And oh, definitely, yes. And, and according to that, as you can correct me if I'm wrong, but they basically have access to all data stored online in the U.S. servers. So can you elaborate on this issue a bit? So who has access to the data? That's your question. Well, um, I, again, I do a two-day cloud security course, <laughs> and that only scratches the surface of it. Um, Generally speaking, um, if, if you're the owner of the data, you have to figure that out for yourself. And there's a lot of you know, ways, lots of controls that you can apply uh, that make that data more secure. Um, Edward Snowden himself says, well, and he, he should know, <laughs> so he, he, he says, put your trust on encryption, because that's the only thing that will really work. Uh, so if you're a corporation or an individual, and you, I mean, you run stuff in, 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 in that cloud, uh, make sure that you apply encryption wherever necessary. Now, as for the Patriot Act, you know, um, the, um, as somebody said, uh, the Patriot Act um, adds almost nothing um, to the powers of the U.S. government to get at your data in compared to what they already have. I mean, there's bilateral agreements between basically all countries in the world on the exchange of data. If you traffic in credit card numbers in one country, and, and it crosses a border, um, th that, that data will, be, will get subpoenaed by the re relevant authorities. You don't need the Patriot Act for that. Um, how scary is the Patriot Act? Well, uh, again, that's up to you to decide. Uh, but the stuff that goes wrong, I mean, there's, there's, there's stuff that goes wrong that's more imminent than, than you know, uh, these two million people in the, in the US that have a se top secret security clearance. I mean, that's really bad, but there's stuff that's much more imminent. And uh, we should work on that at least, you know. We, this is a, a point for a personal story I have. Uh, last November, I got a message from the Italian legal something saying that, uh, uh, and it was translated into Dutch, but it was done by Google, so I couldn't understand any of it. I mean, can you imagine Italian legalese translated into Dutch? Totally incomprehensible. But it mentioned like 500 euros and it, looked, and it was a, like a measurement and it was a car. So I thought, no, this must be a speeding ticket. And then I figured out where it was. It was in the south of Italy. I was not in the south of Italy. You know? I was not there. I was in Amsterdam at that point. I, was, I had been in Italy the year before. Um, but I never rented the car there. So I said, well, this must be a mistake. And I faxed them some information, get an email back. And I said, well, no, here's proof. Here's the contract with the car rental company. And it had my name on it with all the initials and my driver's license number. Uh, <laughs> and my, I think it was my date of birth as well. I said, whoa, what the heck's going on here? Right? So I called in some lawyers and, and complained again, and then I said, well, this cannot be me. And they well, wrote some more letters and wrote some more letters, and then I think in the end, uh, you know, the, the Italians got sick of it and, and dropped it, but I never, they never told me. So I don't know what really happened, but I could, I mean, with that document, I could actually look into the information, that into the database, or, or in one of my files at the car rental agency, or the files of the guy renting the, the, the car, and he had ran up three other speeding tickets, so, but they were a little, little lower, so they were actually booked on his credit card, which was also on that you know, contract, although the numbers were, were blocked out, unfortunately, because it could have made a killing on that credit card. 
So what probably happened, oh yeah, and uh, the credit card, there was part of it was visible and it had my last name on it, but not my initials. So what probably happened was that somebody was going into that office and said, yeah, I rented a car with you. Oh, I, you have, been, have you been here before? Yes, I've been here before. Ah, I see we have your details. Uh, you see your, your, uh, uh, we, we have your driver's license uh, information. Yeah, we have that cable. Cut and paste, done. But it, those were not his driver's license uh, um, information. It was my driver's license because the year before that, my, my wife rented the car and I was a co-driver. So that's probably what happened. So sloppy use of data you know, uh, is costing people severe problems. This is a simple example. A couple of years before that, I got a call said, yeah, you got, you got these cars that you borrowed because your own car was in repair. Do you know where it is? I said, no, no. What do you mean? You've lost them? No, it was like a week ago. Yeah, yeah we sort of, uh, no, well, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> And it happened twice in a row with you. So they were suspicious. And then they, oh, well, you gotta tell me what's going on. Well, yeah, we will later. Three months later, the whole story came. Turned out that there was a guy working at the garage, loved to work out late at night and on Saturdays. He took the keys and the cars were used in an armed robbery, right? Car with my name on it, used in an armed robbery. Somebody could have been killed there, you know? And that's uh, you know, what happens with sloppy control of information. Th th these are real risks. Uh, I should get back to your question. <laughs> um, that if, it, well, even though two million uh, Americans was a top secret clearance, it's, it's way out of line. Uh, I don't consider that a serious risk to my personal safety or track record or, or whatever. So when I mean, you get to decide on that, and as I said, if you don't if you don't want to trust these providers, either don't use them, or make sure you encrypt uh, encrypt your stuff. And in the end. I'd like the government uh, to take care of some aspects of my data. I'd like the government to be able to, to track some of that data. In fact, I'd like those governments to come into the car rental agency, see how if they messed up and clear the whole, I mean, uh, close them, you know? It's criminal what they're doing. That's what they should be doing. And they should have the power to do that. So there's a balance of power. And that's, you know, getting back to my Star Wars pictures. What's the balance? You know, we cannot live in a, in, a, in a world where there's no privacy at all. And we cannot live in a world where there's no um, control from a government-like agency over at least some of that data. And a legal system that controls what we are allowed to do with the data and what we're not allowed to do with the data. It's my strong belief that we should regulate the use of data more than its capture. I mean, that these, the problem with... I mean, people fall over each other in complaining about, and like, okay, oh, the NSA, they, they track all our data as if we didn't know that. that was, that's not the point. I mean, that the Secret Service can get a hold of us, of our, our data, we know that. The problem is, two million people had blanket access to that. That's the problem. People get killed by that, you know? Oh, I got in care, this is my, so I got to get off of my soapbox, you know? <laughs> you know, a couple of months ago, there was the, the Ohm Festival in the Netherlands, and we had all these ex- TLA people, and they said, well, we all this data, why do we need this data? I mean, with all the data we had, we could have prevented 9-11. We didn't need all the data that we collected afterwards. We didn't need it. We could have done it with the data we had. So what's going on is that military industrial complex that keeps on like, yeah, we need more data, we need more data, we need more data because it makes us look better. It doesn't, you know, it only gets more people employed by the military and doesn't make us any safer. Sorry, I get carried away. Do you feel I've answered your question? <laughs> any more questions? Hands up, guys, if you've got any more questions. I'm sorry, I'm having a, a little bit of trouble seeing in the light, so... Uh, so how are we doing on time? Okay, give you a nice uh, No clean. more questions? No? Oh, there's one up there. There is? Yeah, there's one up there. Somebody with second thoughts, I, I think. Let me get to the listening station here. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, could we go back like uh, two or three slides to the good and bad side? This yeah. one? Yeah, this one, this one. Uh, could you please uh, show or tell us uh, how do you, for example, uh, think which is a good guy and which is the bad <laughs> guy? Or Because uh, now you already said there is some government, so government could be good or bad as well. And uh, if uh, there is no restrictions and rules, there could be chaos as well. So this is like the main question and it's very interesting. Either side of the government and restrictions and the law and other stuff. 
uh, okay, it's a, it's a very, very, very good question. Um, but um, when it comes to moral, moral advice, don't listen to me, right? <laughs> I'm not the one who should tell you what to do. I can give you examples of choices that you can make, and I can give you some of the implications of those choices. For example, if you think, well, this is the you know, NSA kind of people, the bad guys that's snooping on, on us, these guys are also catching real criminals. You know? They're catching credit card fraud, they're catching child pornography, they're catching all kinds of bad stuff. You know? And these guys, uh, with, with all the benefit that they want to do, are sometimes creating the technology for the bad guys. When I've worked in government projects where we were involved in you know, security issues, not a, you know, national, uh, uh, on, on a secret level, but like identity management on citizens. How do we keep track of citizens? And where do we put all that data? That's where we need to start thinking about the implications. What does it mean if we have a single key, like a social security number, that's a key to all the databases that the entire government has, as well as a lot of, of the, the, the private uh, you know, uh, industry? This is what hap what's happening in the United States, and it's leading to massive identity fraud. And that's a big nuisance for a lot of people. You've got to think those scenarios through. Say, well, listen, th this might not be the best balance between security and safety. Because that was what Eisenhower was talking about. We need an educated... Well, I think I, I cut that out of the quote. You can you know, go to Wikipedia and find it. We need to find a educated people that, under, that, uh, that drives, uh, that, that helps us, um, that understands what's going on so that we can have a good balance b between security and privacy and whatever, I think, safety, and, uh, there was a, and prosperity, I think he said. So, uh, and if anything, is w what you can do is, uh, well, if your own, w what's your own choice? So back, back to your question. Your own choice would be, I mean, I don't know what your choice would be. Uh, but you know, not working for the government is not necessarily best, the best choice, right? Uh, and, uh, and if anything, um, that if, if there's anything that you can do, even in an hour or two, go talk to a politician and, uh, and make him understand what's going on, because they're totally clueless, right? They don't understand anything of this. And even the smallest bits of understanding will be tremendously helpful. And they will prevent, or they will enable the politicians to keep better control of this military industrial complex. Because in the end, it's the politicians you know, that, rule, that, that, that govern our world, at least um, so far. Right? Does that answer your question? Sort of, right. <laughs> Okay. I'm sorry about it. Now I'm, I'm, I'm throwing it back to you. You have to, you have to make up your own mind. Uh, if you think the government's the bad, the bad guys, I mean, if ever, everybody leaves the government because they don't want to work with it, who's going to control, who's going to do the good things that governments do? Somebody's got to educate them. Any more questions? Hands up, guys. Anybody? Just uh, that you ran into politics a bit. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, when a politician loses their seat in the UK, um, all their advisors or the civil servants who make up help make policies and, and advise on policies, they don't go. So uh, there's, there's that side of it as well, whether it, there is a true democracy. But be, because of, you know, the whole government, the whole home office doesn't all get picked out and etc. etc. you know. Um, so what's the question? Uh, I'm just making the point. That the, <laughs> I can write to a politician, okay. but it's well, the people behind them pushing him. That well, you know, who's actually saying you should go with this policy? Well, and then so educate some civil servants, you know, and they're too many. No, we go educate some civil servants that uh, advise the politicians. You know, any education is better than no education, and and I mean, you'll you'll find people are willing to listen so as long as you keep. Speaking in a polite way. That's why anonymous was surely formed. I'm sorry. What's that? That's why anonymous was surely formed. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have their point in, and uh, they have their role in history. Let's leave it at that. Any more questions? You can see it better than I can do, uh, Priscilla. <laughs> After she, won she has a question. <laughs> Does anybody have a question? No? Okay. 
Thank you very much, Peter, for drawing on your vast experience. Thanks so much. A uh, round of applause for Peter Van Eyck. Okay, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. And at five, we'll be having Louis Ivan Quende, who will be talking about Bitcoin. Thank you.